Okay, so good evening. Uh, my name is Miles Thurlow and I'm the co-founder of Workplace Foundation, which is a charity set up by Workplace Gallery to support emerging and underrepresented artists based in the north of England. This evening we'll be hosting the first in a series of conversation events. Uh, we'll be doing this every Tuesday at 8pm. This week, artist Claire Dorset will be in conversation with curator and writer Jess Fernie. Uh, Claire Dorset was born in 1985 in the UK and graduated from her BA Honours in Fine Art Painting at the University of Brighton in 2007 and from MFA Painting at the Slade School of Art in 2010. Since then she has exhibited both nationally and internationally. She lives and works in Manchester. Uh, Claire had a solo exhibition with Workplace Foundation in 2019. And Jess is an independent curator and writer based in Essex, UK. She works with galleries, architectural practices and public realm organisations on public programmes, commissioning schemes, exhibitions and residency projects across the UK and abroad. Working primarily beyond gallery walls, Jess is interested in an expansive idea of contemporary artistic practice, which encompasses dialogue, research, engagement and serendipity. Jess has worked with organisations including Focal Point Gallery, Tate, Museum of London, Serpentine Gallery, Reba, Manchester International Festival, Olympic Delivery Authority, St Paul's Cathedral, Central St Martin's, University of Essex, Lund Cathedral and the RCA. Um, so welcome, I'm, I'm in my heart, everybody is in these um, strange and, and intimate settings around the country. Um, apologies in advance if we have any technical issues and we'll just stumble through and um, hopefully it'll be all fine and dandy. There'll be plenty of time at the end, hopefully for questions. So if you can, if you can use the chat function to send them through um, and I'll read them out at the end. So uh, welcome Jess and welcome Claire. You should be, can we hear you? I'm muted. Hello. It's Hello. I'm muted, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi okay. Miles, hi Claire. Hello, hello. 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 Okay. Hi everyone out there, wherever <laughs> you are. Um, as Miles said, I'm in um, in Essex, in my my really tidy shed, um, and actually I'm in Colchester, where Miles apparently grew up. So all roads lead to Essex. I just found that out yesterday. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me, Miles and Claire. It was a really nice invitation in these incredibly strange times. Yeah. Um, I started sort of becoming aware of Claire's work in 2014 when I was the Associate Curator of Public Programmes at First Sight, a gallery in Colchester. Um, and we had a solo show of Bruce McLean's work, which is one of the, you know, massive highlights of my time at First Sight. It was just such a joy to work on, you can imagine, Claire. Yeah. And laughing <laughs> minute, it was amazing. Um, and so I devised a public programme and part of the kind of um, impetus behind one of the events was to sort of honour and reflect and think about Bruce's uh, career as a tutor at the Slate and his influence. So um, we decided to um, have an event when we invited artists um, who had worked with, oh, sorry, I've just gone a bit weird there. Um, who'd worked, uh, been taught by Bruce at the Slade and that was Claire uh, as well as Corinna Teal, Eddie Farrell and Chloe Steele, um, most of whom I'm still in contact with which is really really nice but what was brilliant about that evening it's just like completely kind of locked into my mind is one of my sort of favourite events I did at first sight is that it was totally nuts do you remember it Claire? <laughs> Yeah, it was. It was. It was like each of you did a talk, a performance, a screening, um, and it was really playful and respectful and um, dynamic. It really kind of reflected Bruce's kind of practice and also obviously your practice, which I thought was, you know, just really, really touching. And so we've kept in contact ever since. Um, so that's six years ago. And it's really yeah, nice to I'm see <laughs> I was worried that night that we'd all do similar things, but we didn't. We totally did different things. No, I know. You totally did do very different things. But there was this lovely strand, which I can't really express, but it was, you know, the sort of essence of Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> so we're here tonight to talk about primarily um, your show at the Workplace Foundation last year, but we can sort of bob about and I can see Miles has got other images. But um, 
the thing that I really love, there are many things I love about Claire's work, but you know, it's, it's the, um, the kind of honesty, the humor, the awkwardness, the fact that they're kind of both dumb and sharp. Um, and sort of really importantly, I think they sort of very easily could fail or there's a sort of sense that there's a sort of fragility about them that I, I've always really, really enjoyed. And also the fact that a lot of them are large scale paintings and they're interested, I think, in the sort of historical reference points and the trajectory of paintings trying to kind of, you know, um, interest in the kind of bombast and the physicality and the machismo that's often connected to paintings and often is related to the kind of um, the male artist. Um, and there's a sense that the, the paint's been applied really quickly, but there's a kind of really tight visual language. Um, and then the balance of the colour and the words and imagery really kind of work within the framework of the, the canvas. Um, and I think this painting, actually, the one that Miles has just put up here, um, Bad Lighting, is the work that I used to publicise the first site event. Do you remember that, Claire? It was, yeah, it was. Yeah. Yes. But you said it was quite Bruce. <laughs> exactly. But I absolutely loved it. And I, I, I thought I'd just, you know, mention it before we um, kicked off in our conversation, because I think this is the work that kind of really struck me as just really, it's so abject, it's funny, it's tragic. There's this sort of central light bulb with these cartoon um, flicks off them, which kind of are supposed to kind of represent a sense of a kind of impressive, sparkly, active idea. But the fact that, these, that the lamp has no shades and that the, the wire's all bent um, and that the, I just love the fact that the title, this is what you do, we can get onto this, um, I'm sure, in a bit, but the title is just such a direct reference to the work. It just says exactly what it is. It's bad lighting. And then you've got this really kind of wit, sort of outmoded 70s decor, sort of green wallpaper and orange paint. Um, it's kind of the per perfect painting for me. It balances formal concerns. You've got the division of the canvas, your eye rests at the bottom, it feels secure because you've got this blue horizontal line um, and you can kind of appreciate the lamp riding up from that point. But yeah, so I just wanted to start off with that. Um, and then we can, and we can move into the, um, the actual, the, the exhibition that you did at, um, at workplace okay so we can go into some of those um actually claire before we do that do you, do you want to just say it'd be lovely to hear you talk a bit about that painting bad uh, yeah, I can do. yeah. <laughs> a while ago but i love it so much um yeah so that painting was made in the garage of my mum's house um which wouldn't feels important actually as to maybe what's gone into it uh, well, subconsciously nice. or consciously yeah um and also it was after a series of paintings I'd made that had been, I guess if you could imagine the sort of right hand side of the painting where it's blue lines on the orange, it would probably be like two layers like that. Very, very crisp, very, very flat with no sense of error in them whatsoever. And they were just a little bit dead. Like they just had, like that series of paintings just really felt flat. And so I think I was frustrated and and this was one of those classic times where you're just sort of doing something and then you go back to it and go, oh wait, that actually really works. It's like you had to do, you had yeah. to set up four of them for one of them to work. And yeah. I couldn't necessarily say I went in with the intention in any painting of knowing what was going to happen. It's always like a backwards discovery of, oh yeah, that works, what happened there? Um, so I think the background for me was kind of like a rebellion against these, these very slick, very, um, sharp almost kind of not perfect but you know um a little bit more controlled than normal for me i guess um with yeah. no sense of fall in them whatsoever um and that's what came out and i i love things that are a little bit crap you know they have yeah. a tender tender part in my heart because i just think ultimately like <laughs> we're all a little bit crap you know in our own ways and that's kind yeah. of interesting you know it gives character so i, I think it adds character to the actual object as well yeah yeah and that's what you've done with sofa i know um miles yeah. is up on the screen <laughs> now i'm sort of thinking that that lamp would look really good next to that sofa no Not that's actually a really good point 
I'm not trying to do that. I probably in some way got like a whole variety to make some sort of living. Yeah, room. yeah. It's <laughs> not the same abject owner, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's something that's been said before, that like people look at the work and they feel like like this character has walked out the room. Yeah. Which I kind of understand that they have like a persona. Uh, yeah without that persona necessarily being physically present yeah and let's talk a bit about this sofa now it's here miles is um just presenting us as random images that's great we can just <laughs> trip on from that um, <laughs> yeah so this is another example of um a work that's just very straightforwardly called exactly what it is it's just yeah. sofa and sofa it's like a word and a painting that is almost the same thing i love that kind of doubling up is that something that you know you I mean obviously you're massively aware of it but it's so playful and I'm sure there's a really fancy term for it in kind of linguistic terms about an idea of sort of you know kind of double vision or two things representing the same thing at once you know sofa and sofa is that something that you've you know obviously you've clearly thought about uh, well, so just sometimes I just think that obvious things aren't that obvious like we all assume that they are but actually being able to or taking the time to start from the very beginning is something we all rush to the end of things very often um and and, and no, i try not to i try and work on the premises that assumption is the mother of all mess ups so it's like this is a sofa and also if i did some big philosophical title um you know and i'm trying to lead people into certain thoughts or feelings about the work I just feel like that's too much of me it's like I'm just going to give you the bare bones of what this is and the rest is kind of up to you you can I don't want to right. put so much of myself in it that there's there's not enough for other people um and also well, I want the work to be fairly <laughs> sorry it could be seen as being really prescriptive if it's overly sort of um described or um you know located in the work I think there's a sense if it, a painting's title has too much in it it's just loading too much on the painting it just seems to be that, that you're just saying this is a sofa look at it look at what it is it's just yeah. that is what it's standing for yeah and also um i think there's something kind of funny about pointing at the elephant in the room as well you know yeah. just being like no there it is that's what that yeah. is and like i think about um i think about play and i think about the way that children look at things like particularly now a lot of my friends are having children like having children and it's brilliant because they they don't assume anything everything is kind of new to them and they're looking at it freshly and yeah. you know uh, they're learning about things and I just think there's that kind of curiosity and wonder of yeah. things back to their basics um is important I think um and, and it's something that we forget about and I mean I forget about it too it's like oh, hang on let's just take stock of what is actually around us um, but there's also something slightly tragic about it it has to be said it's you know you can sort of marvel in the simplicity of it but if you look at it it's it's you know it's really really well used um probably needs to be replaced um it's kind of old-fashioned decor like the lamp Mm. um it it doesn't it looks like one of those old sofas that doesn't allow for you know serious comfort like you wouldn't really lounge on it that was certainly not two people I mean, there's a sense of sort of abjectness about it that is it's not quite cozy it's kind of a bit sad is that yeah i think yeah i think a lot there is an underlying sadness in a lot of the work and kind yeah. of like a like a ah, like laughing and then oh wait hang on uh there's some maybe not great going on here yeah um, the kind of, I'd wanted to paint a sofa for a really long time. Why? Why? Years, you... Like years ago, I did a show in a project space in the studio space that I'm at. And yeah. I, for a while, was was like, should I, should I do a project space? Maybe I should run a project space. And I kind of really liked the idea of that if I did do a project space, that it would be called sofa. And there'd just be this really chintzy sofa in the middle of the gallery instead of like a hard bench. Like, I think having somewhere to sit to look at work is, is important, but those benches have no back support and <laughs> it's just all a little bit like it's not conducive to yeah. sitting with something and I like the idea that you could have like these curators I mean this is pipe you know like up in the sky thinking yeah. but you can have these like well-known curators that having a cup of tea on this chintzy sofa looking at a piece of work and so I guess that kind of like uh, demystifying yeah kind of gallery space yeah uh, and then I decided that actually it was project space or painting so painting one um, and then I guess 
I kind of identify with the sofa a little bit. It's like, I'm in my mid thirties now, I'm all right with that. I'm a little bit softer, that's okay. Like, you know, and so there's uh, an element of this sort of like well-worn, I guess similar to the lampshade of like, yeah. just like you say, the fragility, like, you know, the humanity of like living in the world yeah. and kind of wanting to tap into that, I guess, in the way that I know how to. Or, yeah. Yeah. To know how to, um, yeah, I think there's a hell of a lot of humanity in your work, but also the way you express yourself and the way that you live, I think there's a big crossover, but we can talk about that in a bit. But Miles, can you put um, uh, No Pressure on the screen? It's another one of the paintings that Claire did for the um, Workplace Foundation exhibition. It's like we've got a floating ghost. We I have. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Miles. Yeah. Thanks, Miles. So I, well, I remember when I met you, you told me a story about um, Bruce when you first met him and what yeah. he said to you and your sort of first interaction. Um, I wonder if you can relay it here because I think there's a connection with this painting. Yeah. Like very often with things they repeat like over years and years, either as images and until they find homes and maybe in the work or they might have multiple homes. Um, kind of like, I think the first week at Slade where we'd sort of got settled into our studios, I was up a ladder putting some works on a ledge, just sort of trying things out. And Bruce came in and pointed at me when I'm on the ladder and went, you, I'm expecting big things from you. And my automatic reaction without even thinking was, uh, no pressure. Like, and he started laughing and I started laughing and then it just, it's a running joke now. He'll still say it if I speak to him, like, no pressure, no pressure, no pressure. Because ultimately there's always pressure. There's always <laughs> pressure. <laughs> and every time someone says no pressure, there is definitely pressure. To be there. pressure. Yeah. And certainly from Bruce as well. Much yeah. Pressure. I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's the yeah, end. Nowhere to yeah. aim there. Right. Yeah. Cool. Um, so this painting is called No Pressure, and this is, uh, what, when, when were you, when did you have that conversation with Bruce? When was that, like 10 years ago? Or? That was 2008 when I started, so yeah. yeah. 12 years ago. I love it, the way that things kind of, you know, bubble through into later works. That's great. And I think this is, um, it's, a, it's another kind of, key, well, you know, there aren't loads of works in the show. It's one of the things I love, I love about it is that each one is just, you know, a very particular kind of, language in itself um, and there are only what eight of them in, in the workplace foundation show there uh sorry i just got a text message from bruce that threw me off so we knew we were talking oh about bruce it. what are you <laughs> are you saying no pressure you <laughs> bruce mclean they want to know oh, um bruce mclean is who we're talking about sorry there's a question there bruce McLean. right yeah, sorry everyone. Bruce, Bruce McLean is a, a brilliant um, artist. He's now in his 70s, but he, um, he taught at the Slade for 25 years and is, um, as a result, he's, there's loads and loads of artists across Britain who are sort of, you know, bow at the altar of Bruce McLean. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was actually Miles who texted me, not Bruce. I just saw Bruce in the side. So yeah, to explain who Bruce was, Bruce McLean. Um, right. So um, yeah, um, there was, let's see, three, four, five, six, six paintings. In yeah, time. I like that kind of show, six paintings. That's brilliant. Um, and Miles, if we go back to the no pressure one, um, if we look at that, I re you know, I'm interested in the relationship of the text to the painting. Mm. And as you can see that um, when, uh, for everyone who's looking at it, there's all these references to kind of... Um, social and physical, uh, financial, emotional um, connections. So it's, you know, it's the pressure of living a viable life, you know, finding a husband and being emotionally stable, having the perfect body, um, having just about the right amount of um, availability of sex and fear of being alone, all of that, it's all in there. It's all absolutely kind of ram, but it's very beautifully formed. I don't, I'm not quite sure how you manage it, but it looks in the painting as if it's absolutely, you know, every element is perfectly balanced and it create. there's a sort of idea of, you know, that, that every bit of it is in the right place. And yet it's sort of chaotic and all over the place. But I'm just wondering if you can talk a bit about this work and the relationship to um, 
social media and pressure and what you feel as an artist about expectations on you and how that's reflected in this work um i think also the expectations just as a person as well yeah. <laughs> just as a person living in the world um so i guess this uh, probably the set of work so um sofa was the last of, of sort of three of the most recent paintings in that show so no pressure the telly painting which we'll probably come on to and then sofa so i would say is probably the most um, possibly familiar in terms of the visuals of it into other works that perhaps i've made of it being quite empty uh, whereas these works i'd made sort of three three paintings before that had really fought back with me so i go through this if i feel if I make quite a bare minimal painting, I, there's something in me that then wants to react and make something completely different to that. And I think right. something to do with that is like the energy that if I feel like I know what I'm going to do, then I'm not interested in it particularly. And I kind of feel that if I'm not interested, then you could probably feel that in the actual painting when it's done. Yeah. So I wanted to play with that, to play with something that was a little bit more of a battle that fought back. So this did fight back and it went on in terms of painting it it took me a lot longer than usual to 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 balance it as you say to be like right well i've done this it's like a series of moves i've done this move and then oh but that i need to do this move now and yeah in terms of imagery and color um i knew i wanted to reflect something of like this onslaught of visual imagery that like i was thinking about this the other day like the only time when I'm not influenced by anything is probably when I'm sat in complete silence. Like anything, like reading a book, listening to a podcast, listening to the radio, like having a conversation. All of those things are perhaps other people's thoughts that you're coming into contact with and trying to filter and decipher and then trying to figure out what you think from all of that as well. Yeah. Um, and also this emphasis on how things, how things look and how we look um, and, and sort of showing. I think throughout the work, I have this uh, interest between what is presented and and what is behind closed doors i guess so this idea of a persona um, and yeah. there's a book i read, read years ago that talked about musicians and how like you know david bowie is a prime example of someone who has an alter ego or a persona yeah and then the artist bob and roberta smith talks about mark bolan being on stage with his hot silver jacket on and then mark bolan being at home sat on the sofa having a cup of tea with his hot silver jacket on and yeah. i kind of like both of those things um so yeah, and just uh, outbursts of contradictory uh, thoughts that I have myself as well. It's like, I don't know if you can properly read it, it doesn't even matter. It's like, oh, it's too easy now. It's too easy with all these apps. And uh, well, is it? Because it still feels quite difficult, actually. Like, and what is this perfect life? And does anyone actually have it? And Because yeah. uh, as far as I'm aware, most people have started to don't <laughs> or then you know uh, and do you what do you want that you know and also just poking fun at the whole thing because i think i can't stand apart and say oh i don't participate in social media i totally do you know like i love instagram uh, it's this kind of like love hate relationship that i think everybody has and and i'm not perfect with it uh, and and so i'm not trying to be judgmental of anyone who does use it or how they use it i'm just trying to kind of hold it up and be like what is this? I'm thinking about this. Do, do you think about that? Yeah. Um, but using figures as well was kind of uh, new and fairly difficult, actually, um, of trying to make sure that I, I felt that the, the, the figures were sort of balanced. And it felt quite important for me for the central figure to feel more male than female. Um, just Why because that? I didn't want it to be seen as a self-portrait. Right. Um, and I felt that if I put a female figure in, or, or what would look like a possibly a female figure that perhaps people yeah. would see as me. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And you've said in an interview I was reading a couple of days ago that really bad tends to happen when I overthink it. Yeah. And there, I can really get the sense that there's this kind of tightrope in so much of your work between sort of being really spontaneous, but also having a, you know conviction or intention about what it is that you want to do yeah you, have to kind of, you talked about it just now maintaining the energy of a painting and it just seems that i think that's one of the things i really like about the painting is that there's just this really close sort of point at which everything could fall to pieces and everything could fail and that i'm thinking maybe many paintings do fail and that you just select the ones that you know that don't but is that is that how you kind of um see the paintings do you have a sense that there's a 
something that's sort of magical holding them together, this energy, this unknown thing, but then this intention that brings it to a sort of formal presence. The, there was many points in that painting that I was like, what am I doing? Yeah. Like, like and you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were, but I'm like, to some extent, I have to commit to it. It's like, yeah. it's going to fail. You may as well be committed. Don't like half arse it. Like yeah. just fully fall flat on your face. And, and I kind of swing between hate. Very often I finish a piece of work and I'll hate it. I'll absolutely hate it. And I have to run away from it. And the reason I have to run away from it is because I'm in danger of not actually looking at what I've done because I'm so in the, I guess, the emotional moment of hating what I've done. That yeah. I can't get any perspective on it. Um, so these ones, I mean, there's not another set of four paintings this big that didn't make the cut. I would say the kind of editing process is in drawing. Um, right. So I'll keep a lot of, I keep sketchbooks all the time. Um, I don't have set parameters for them. It's like, a, it's like the container series of outbursts, I guess, as I kind of grab things. <laughs> um, so there's like a lot of that. And so actually getting to the point where I'm making painting can take quite a long time. And then making yeah. paintings probably feel quite, quite um, quick. So um, I guess that's kind of how the editing, and, and like I say, you just have to commit with it. It's like, well, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Good off of that. Um, and that painting as well, I was thinking about the Laura Owens, and I think I talked about that in the interview with Ambit magazine. Um, oh, yeah. Last year. Like, she did this fantastic painting, huge painting, like bigger than anything that like, I've made, like floor to ceiling in workplace is um, gallery space. And it's covered in cats. Cats almost about the same size as a cat, almost like a line drawing of a cat. Yeah. But, or to form a sort of pattern, but it kind of feels sort of fuller than that. Um, and I just thought that that was fascinating for, in terms of formally, like how can you, very often there'll be one centre point in my paintings, it'll be something zoomed in or zoomed out, but yeah. how can, is it possible to do a painting where your eyes roaming all over and sort of internally within that, within the frame? So that was kind of, uh, I guess, a bit of a challenge as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was looking at, um, I know you've talked about Laura Owens and Philip Guston in the past. I think it's interesting they're both American, but yeah. I read an interview with um, Laura Owens in, I think it was in New Yorker or the LA Times or something. Um, and there were just so many bits in her conversations that reminded me of your work. And I had to, um, let me just, if I can find this quote. Um, so in a journal that Owens kept in her early 20s, she wrote a 14 point list entitled, and this is in her early 20s. I thought it was a diary from when she was 10 or something. This is brilliant. How to be the best artist in the world. Have you read it? <laughs> no. It's but so it's so brilliant. Brilliant. It's like in her early 20s, it's so brilliant. And then among the dictates are think big, contradict yourself constantly, no guilt, do not be afraid of anything, say very little. Know that if you didn't choose to be an artist, you would have certainly entertained world domination or mass murder or sainthood. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> That's a little bit terrible. Oh, that was so great. <laughs> Isn't that just brilliant? It's just so, it's so playful and, um, you know, kind of recognising that there is this kind of, it's, it's just this absolute tunnel vision that you have to have as a painter to kind of yeah. believe in yourself and to commit yourself to something that you just think is going to not be understood or not relate to the world or not work in any way yeah um and and then also i think it, the, the fact that she's really interested in kind of sort of smashing the machismo of painting especially you know within the sort of cal arts environment that she existed in um, I think relates to, I, I mean, I don't, you know, it's, I don't want to put you too much in your work, but there's another quote that she said, I don't like somebody fetishizing their skill level. Painting is one of the few mediums where the skill level can just take over and really seduce people, yeah. seduce people. And I, it was a question to you about how you feel about, not necessarily as a female artist, but maybe as a female artist, as an artist working in the 21st century and your relationship to this kind of bombastic, canvas of you know the uh, um a painting i'm kind of um i'm not consciously going i want to make this massive painting because it speaks to the canon of well yeah things that i loved about painting that got me into it was abstract expressionism like was it was like yeah to some extent and pop art and they're like yeah. and a lot of american artists actually and and 
whether that was because that was what I was exposed to on courses or through the course of my own sort of research. Yeah. I think it probably has something to, for a long time, I was quite interested in the American dream of this, like, again, this big thing of like, yeah. is it really real? Like, like, you know, and a lot of those kind of canons of literature, and I can't remember, it's, there's like a quote where it's like, American life is something that takes place in the weeds next to the, bo- the billboard. And it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. I like Las Vegas and like Robert Venturi's book about learning from Las Vegas, you know, yeah. signs and colour and form and things like that. So uh, I think that's something that I kind of look, look to um, or have looked at, at looked to very often. Yeah. Um, it is something that is asked a lot about uh, because of the nature of my work. But I kind of tend to, like, I'm not naive enough to not think that you know that it's referenced but I don't consciously go into it thinking I'm gonna do this because that that and that it's just the work I want to make um yeah but Laura Owens the other thing I love about that list is that there's a sense of her shouting at herself as well which um, I definitely have it's like bullying yourself yeah because there's part of you that you know doesn't necessarily have that ego all the time and isn't arrogant but has to push yourself to keep doing it even though it's difficult it's like doing things like this like I can put my artist hat on and I can do it but I'm actually you know massively introverted and so you know it's it's part of doing the work and I think that sort of plays out in the work as itself as well um, absolutely yeah. the sort of performative well this like hero like almost like a hero thing of like trying and perhaps that's where the American you know American artists fit in because it's so yeah. I live in the UK and, it, and I've never been to America. So it feels like this whole other land. You haven't, that's perfect. Yeah. You must never go to America. It's just yeah. like it's supposed to be this the ideal or this dream or this. Part of me thinks it would just ruin it. Like, I, I mean, I'm not, to anyone watching, I'm not saying America is a dream. <laughs> like, 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 just being aware of current, yeah. of current events. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But this kind of mythical america you know yeah, the um, pretend the, the, yeah the, the something that doesn't exist at all yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. like I, I read a book about matisse and apparently matisse was massively like interested in um he obviously in how matisse looks at color like someone someone compared that um the way that what he was trying to achieve in color in his paintings is what the the neon signs do on the las vegas strip you know essentially they form they create shape through color that you know it's not an outline, it just is the, the form itself. And I remember thinking that that was fascinating formally. And, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, can we have, um, Miles, can you put cool dude whatever on? Um, and I think this is another example. And I, you know, I just think this, this is really lovely that the way that you've used the title in the work, there's that weird looping system again. Um, Cool dude. Sorry, that, which word was that? Sorry, I got distracted. The cool that. dude, whatever. Cool dude, whatever. Yeah. 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 So the heart. Yeah, that one. Yeah. That's quite a good one from Neon. That does make me think of, uh, made me think of like an 80s Neon uh, album. Cool it? Dude, well, it's like the yeah. heart outside uh, Milton Keynes Gallery that's just been reinstituted, and that's from the 1970s. It's exactly oh, okay. that. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Can you t- tell us a bit about this painting? Um, so again, it's like, um, multiple sources kind of coming together at once. So, um, and this very much did happen in, in the sketchbook form. So I had a sketchbook, which recorded some ideas, and then I made a painted book for a show in Manchester in sort of 2017. And I don't work through a book methodically. I don't work from the first page. I tend to work backwards in it and I mix things up so that ideas and forms and imagery gets mixed together so it's not so formulaic and and they can come together in ways that I perhaps haven't thought about before um so this one was a mixture of going to a gig um I went to a gig uh, oh god I'd love to go to a gig I know right remember those it was not that it matters that if you can see this or not but the kind of reference point for the imagery was uh, I went to see Christine McQueen who's who's like an amazing performer and there's something about that atmosphere of seeing a sort of figure in this, like I love stages and theatres and the sort of darkness and the um, anim- anonymity of being in a crowd of people but experiencing something together. Um, so that was kind of something and the way that the stage lights are so dramatic and the forms that they cast with the silhouette. 
so it was kind of that and then um I was painting it and I was also thinking about um like disappointment of like thinking or like belief in a thing or a person um and then having the kind of like wool lifted from your eyes and being like oh it's not like that at all yeah uh, and but then I was also thinking about this kind of like um I guess probably from my own insecurity of sometimes feeling like people are like mm, I'm just just I'm not going to deal with you. I'm, I'm above this. This like too cool, and I'm like, what? Whatever. Okay. If you want to, if you want to carry on with that pretend pretense, then, yeah. then that's fine. But um, and I guess there's almost like um, I guess the brackets. I always think it's like an afterthought. It's like yeah, yeah, I think that, but also maybe not. Maybe it's just me. Um. So yeah, whether any of that comes out in the painting, I don't know. Yeah. Um, no. As as the painting is started. It's it's a formal thing as well. Yeah. I'm thinking um, this lockdown situation that we're all in, mm. I think it has kind of really punctured a lot of, you know, kind of egos and uh, sort of presented us with a kind of new fragile state that is, you know, just much more kind of tender and much more understanding or at least performatively understanding or at least on the surface. I don't know what you think about that. I mean, obviously you're really interested in the idea of something of people presenting an idea of themselves that might not necessarily, you know, you scratch beneath the surface and it's, you know, a crap old sofa kind of thing. I'm just sometimes you're not even aware of it. I think sometimes, I mean, I do it. You're not even aware that you're misrepresenting yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But do you think with the, with this with the, the the pandemic, have you noticed any sort of difference, or do you hope for any difference, a long term change to the way that the art world or postures? You know, Bruce's interest in posturing and mm -hmm. sort of, you know being posing in a certain way. I'm just I've just been interested in the language that certain arts institutions have been using in reference to their um, programs. I think it, it's sort of a newfound understanding of the sort of fragility of the system yeah the, um the institution relies on the precarious nature of you know the artist's voice at, right at the bottom of the heap who has no salary or you know safe um income space i just i'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts about any of that well um, um I, I guess i guess i mean like most things i think the art world is like a microcosm of the world at large like it's like but it tends you know perhaps it's a world that we're involved in more but like most it kind of just highlights things that um are going on on a sort of yeah. wide scope which is why which i think we kind of missed but which is why i really wanted to chat to you because i feel like your practice is based within fine art but looks outwards to how that is applied to other disciplines and basically how we work in the world um i think i'm kind of hoping there's been some really I mean, what's happening is terrible, but in terms of, there's been some positive things for me, like I can attend a meeting, uh, a lecture in America on Friday night, you know, yeah. that's fantastic. I would like that to continue for that kind of information to, to be accessible by everybody, regardless of geographical location um, mm -hmm. as a resource. Um, I kind of think the fact that we can't physically go to a gallery, like you can't just drop in and go to a gallery, and a lot of the way that it seems things have been going is that more art is seen online than it is in real life. And I think the two things are very different, like most things. And I'm wondering if perhaps when things get back to some kind of normal, or if we're, even if it's not a normal, if we're able to go to gallery spaces again, if that will encourage people to do that more and yeah. to, to make it more. It was already on the decline, wasn't it? People yeah. are to galleries. Social media was kind of taking over from the kind of real life experience and art fairs as well which yeah. you know obviously galleries um for most galleries from what i can glean commercially that's where they make their money you know yeah. to thrive um and that's all digital now as well so i guess i wonder if there's things to be learned of like do we need a physical art fair i'm sure they probably do because the human interaction of being able to talk to someone about a work or to meet the artist is very different um but yeah, things like that. I think also it's kind of highlighted I mean, for freelancers, you know, a lot of UK arts institutions have honored their freelance contracts. Some yeah. haven't, um, but a lot of them have. And yeah. I think that's great because I think most people think that people who are freelance are fine and they're making loads of money and they're not, <laughs> you know, they're living, no. 
mostly hand to mouth. Yeah. And they're doing it, uh, and the same for galleries, you know, and they're doing it because they love it, the same as artists are. Yeah, so. I've been really heartened by the galleries that I've been working with. Mm. Everything has been shunted on. All of my projects have been, it's like 2020 doesn't exist. It's like a mm. big hole, apart from Zoom talks. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's been so heartening to work. It's always publicly funded galleries that, you know, the really heartening conversations where they recognise the value of freelancers. And, but I'm just really hoping that the art world will understand that it can't go on relying on this kind of the fragile workforce of the artist in the way yeah. that it has and paying so bad. I mean, I know that's another whole discussion. I'm now looking at the time. It's 20 to 9. <laughs> Um, and also, we have to um, make sure that we get to some of the questions. But yeah. before we do that, Claire, mm -hmm. I feel like we've hardly scraped the surface of your work. But you know, maybe we can do another one in twenty twenty one in real. <laughs> <laughs> it seems so far away, and yet not. <laughs> yeah. What I wanted to do was um, read uh, the text that you commissioned or Bruce McLean wrote. Um, for your exhibition, um, was it for the Workplace Foundation exhibition? It was. It was for um, a publication that is right. um, to yet to come out. Yeah. Um, it's just. It's literally one sentence with no full stop or no um, sort of paragraph breaks. But I thought I'd just read it because I think it does such a good job of relaying um, the essence of Claire's work. Stunning, difficult, thrilling, funny, stupid, dumb, interesting, fabulous balmy, obvious, clever, intelligent, perceptive, illuminating, clumsy, elegant, classy, boring, odd, inspiring, uplifting, thoughtful, questioning, articulate, painterly, lush, scooshy, daft, bright, imaginative, original, witty, sharp, tight, tasteful, mathematical, free, loose, designed, composed, Oh, you froze. Okay. <laughs> you froze a little bit for me. Okay. I don't know <laughs> okay. It says my state internet is unstable. I'll just keep going. You're fine now. <laughs> okay. Sexy, calm, considered, complete, finished, slack, untidy, superb, distinguished, brilliant, genius, quiet, flash. Hot, cool, stunning, smooth, rough, messy, splattered, particular, specific, unique, philosophical, decorative, radical, normal, obtuse, easy, sublime, crazy, problematic, pure, personal, perfect painting. Well done, Bruce. You got it. Well done, Bruce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if he's listening, he'd be like, you talked about me too much. <laughs> We've got to move on from the Bruce loving. I find it very hard. But yeah, um, I thought we could just finish with the, what we were reading at the moment, um, because actually my current reading um, material relates weirdly, and it was completely un- um, you know kind of intended to that reading and this is going to look ridiculous when I put the book up look at the size of this book That's terrifying um, I know and it, <laughs> it's called Lucy Elman Ducks Newburyport okay and it's it's one of the most amazing books I've read it's okay a thousand pages it's made up of one sentence with no full stops wow and no um paragraph breaks and no speech breaks and when I first asked it, I was like, there's no way I'm going to read this. I'm just going to read the first 50 pages just to see what it's about, all the fuss is about, and then that's it. And I literally couldn't put it down. Wow. Um, I think there are just so many kind of crossovers with your work and Bruce's work. There's a kind of immediacy about it, which says sort of flouts convention and says, I'm going to find a different way of communicating. Mm. There's just, I'm just going to read a tiny bit here. I'm going to take my glasses off to do this. Um, it's, it's literally just that instead of having a full stop, there's just um, a, a, a few words that says the fact that. So there's no full stop. It's just the fact that. And it's like a stream of consciousness, basically. The fact that where did I read that? Sometimes doctor don't know if you're really dead or not when you're in a coma, but they want your organs. So it's simpler just to declare you dead. Death panels, NHS. The fact that sometimes people get better later and find out they've already been declared a corpse. The fact that it's kind of like being buried alive in an abstract sort of way. 
and it's a bureaucratic nightmare getting yourself reinstated as a living person. The fact that Catherine Hepburn was into eugenics, the fact that a major light bulb has gone has gone in the downstairs hallway and fixing it involves getting onto to a tall ladder. <laughs> it's the light bulb again. <laughs> <laughs> but you see what I mean? It's like all yeah. these, it's, it's like, it's, she's saying, listen, I don't need paragraphs. I don't need um, full stops. I don't need capital letters. I don't need grammar. I'm just, it's like a, you know, kind of modernist way of communicating, just saying I need to get out what's in my head. And I think yeah, totally. there are parallels with, with your work. Not that I'm saying you should read this thing, but honestly, it's- No, no, it sounds brilliant. It's um, absolutely brilliant. No, I, what I like is it's like, like you say, like a stream of consciousness. Like I, for me, like sketchbooks are like a way of taking all of the thoughts out of my head and yeah. dumping them. It's basically like a brain dump. Yeah. Um, and also, and like, you know, they the, things go on tangents but I, that's how my brain works and i think that's probably how most people's brain it's, it's like not working in a linear way and so why shouldn't your work reflect exactly. that exactly <laughs> yeah yeah it's perfect yeah so um shall we open up for questions miles hello hello yes Whoa. sorry to interrupt um i'm gonna just read out some of these questions i think would that be the best way do you do you feel yeah go for um, it so there's a question here from Chris who says, Hi Claire, all of the works here are very big. How would you feel if you painted smaller works? Chris? <laughs> um, I do paint smaller works, they're just not in the show here. Um, yeah, I do paint smaller works. They tend to either be very, very big or really quite small and not really in the middle. Um, and I think that's something to do with either wanting to blow things up and exaggerate them and then also feel quite intimately about uh, uh, making smaller work as well. So what tends to happen is that I'll be, I'll work on a series of small ones at the same time. I haven't quite figured out if that's because logistically and physically I can do that more than I can do on, like I don't, I don't have the space or the means to make like 10 massive canvases and work on all of those at the same time. I suspect it probably would be different though because the big paintings take a lot more energy um, for me to, to, to physically work on them, whereas smaller ones, I can kind of get them all going at the same time. So yeah, I do, I do work small as well. Uh, and I think it's a small painting can have just as much um, uh, presence as a large painting. I don't think something has to be physically big um, to, to command presence. It's just about how you do something. Uh, Bruce Haynes asks, do you feel like making work at the moment, which I think is a reference to at the moment, e.g. <laughs> lockdown? Yeah. Rather than right now. <laughs> uh, I feel more pressure to, to be making work right now because uh, currently I, um, I do have a day job and I'm furloughed uh, right now. So I have, I guess, more time at, at home, but I can't actually get to the studio right now. Um, so I'm kind of set up in the spare bedroom here at home making smaller works. Um, yeah, I felt, uh, felt very aware that I didn't want to make like, work that reacted to what was happening right now. And so I needed, uh, I needed a few weeks to have some headspace for myself to try and work out what was going on, um, which I still haven't worked out, but you know, just to get used to it. Um, and also, um, yeah, I was aware of not wanting to jump straight in. So now I'm kind of at the point where I'm brewing up again. But it takes a long time for me to feel like I want to start making work, which I think most people are surprised by. Um, I'm not a nine to fiver. I, I, I don't. I don't think painting is a, is like a job in that way. If that makes sense, but that's just what works for me. Um, Abby says, "Really love your paintings," and was wondering how did your MFA change or define your practice, and where does your color palette come from for each painting? Um, good question. Uh, so MFA, I think just stepped it up a gear, like undergrad. Both universities get bright, bright. Brighton was brilliant because they just leave you to your own sort of devices and kind of carefully sort of nurture and support what you're doing. And I felt that my undergrad was about figuring out how I want to paint and that my MFA was what I wanted to say to some extent or cultivating a bit more of a voice. Uh, and some of that is just time and some of it is the environment. Um, you know, all of the shooters there are brilliant. Uh, it changed, it kind of supported my outlook that art isn't just in a vacuum of art itself. And that's kind of why I, I wanted to really wanted you to, to, to be able to do this in conversation tonight as well, Jess. Um, that, you know, when I first started the first year, we were taught by Bruce McLean, the second year was taught by Lisa, Lisa Milroy, both, both fantastic artists in completely different ways. 
uh, and the whole emphasis was like you are in the Slade School of Fine Art which is part of a bigger older university UCL and so while you're here why would you just stay to yourself like go and talk to people in other departments like move around most art schools I know are really sad that we don't have like a communal canteen anymore because that's where some of the really great conversations happen when like an engineer bumps into an artist and they're just having a chat like it's that's how you innovate and and sort of move things forward I think um so yeah I think it, it helped me work out what I wanted to say and that was just time and space and having good people around you really uh, and the color palette um um tends to be I work a lot with sort of marker pens and so I kind of am aware that I want to keep the the um the color palette of the paintings similar so I don't tend to mix a lot of colors tend to use things straight out of the tub to kind of keep to sort of mirror that um, but I like really saturated color um and I and I love black for its graphic quality so um yeah I don't know if that answers that question but yeah um Cecile says, can you please say a little about the apparent directness and immediacy of your work and whether you are interested in making a particular sense of time in your painting? Um, directness and immediacy, I think, has something to do with, uh, as Jess was talking about titles earlier, like this painting is called Sofa and it is of a sofa. Um, it's like, um, I don't really like faffing about. I kind of it's sort of, I, I want things to be done fairly quickly to install a sense of, I guess, confidence in, in the work, that even if there is a vulnerability to it or a fragility to it, that you still have confidence in it. Um, so that's kind of why immediacy and directness um, are important. Uh, and then time within the paintings. Um, within the paintings themselves, I don't, I think that's something I would need to really think about. Um, hopefully I would like to make work that is fairly universal, uh, but I am aware of paintings like No Pressure are probably particularly kind of pinned down to, to now, um, which is maybe a little bit newer. I mean, I can't help being a 34 year old woman living in the world today and that's gonna come out in some way, um, mm. whether I want it to or not really. Um, yeah, that's a difficult question. I do get the sense that it's really important to you that a lot of these works are universal They're, as you said when you were talking to me it's not a kind of um self um, autobiography it's not like this is Hopefully my experience of the world. you're looking at you know the kind of experience of you know just living in the world as a human and looking I at i think it's a difficult concepts. balance because you have to kind of reference yourself in some way because that's all you've got to go on yeah. but you, you also don't want to uh, pin it down and make it too specific to yourself because yeah. then it's just uh, sort of self-interested I guess yeah um, yeah there's a question here from Ella in fact she asked two questions but I'm just going to ask the first one because I think you've covered the second one okay. um, but you seem to get a lot of your inspiration from your surroundings and the observation of people how has lockdown affected you affected your creativity or inspiration and I think I quite like at the end of this talk to open that up to both of you um, <laughs> um, yeah I mean I have a lot of books to go on um, so I, as it is I don't tend to work on I don't work with material that's in the book I'm working on right now I tend to go back to older books with the intention of hopefully having a bit more distance from those moments and sort of being able to pick out something that might be a bit more universal um, I kind of I do I miss the sort of, I guess what, it might not be how you use it, but the serendipity, just uh, like I love that that's in your biography, but like of just of bumping into a person and having the yeah. conversation either about work or like, like I mean, I can have conversations via Zoom, I can have phone calls, but there's something about the, the well, supposed randomness of being walking down the street and going, oh, hey, it's that person or meeting someone you've never met before, you know, and just, I kind of miss that. Um, but I'm still able to make work about what is around me and I think uh, a lot of uh, my work is with, with very basic objects and so I can kind of invent things from what's going on in my house really and in my own imagination. Um, but I think going back to the other question with the work, I want the work to, to not just be for like an art audience, like I would really love that somebody comes to it without necessarily going to art school yeah. and being like, you know what, I like that. Like, uh, well, that's I don't like that, that and this is why. 
that's one of the things that connects our practice i mean i don't i don't i don't think i've ever worked with a, a painter like you know in my practice but mm. i think it's the fact that you know we're interested in a kind of more expansive broader conversation with you know people beyond the gallery space in a way a kind of more you know a, a slightly different kind of viewpoint i just i kind of think that art is um and i think this is probably something that was really absorbed from being at the slide as well is that art is a way of questioning reflecting and looking at the world and that we all have our own different languages and you know science is a very creative uh, field as is maths it's just it's languages that people kind of have like a um they're sort of geared more towards one and the other and i think the only way that we can kind of progress is through all having conversations <laughs> and like learning from each other and learning from works and people's inventions and sort of edging forward i guess um yeah okay i think um here we are it's nine o'clock that's yeah. gone so quickly that hasn't it and all these lovely <laughs> questions thanks so much everyone yeah, thank, thank, you. thank you thank you for attending i just saw sean pennington pop up with i love the soup of ideas and i love that as the sentence that's a brilliant sentence <laughs> <laughs> use that in a painting sean <laughs> of ideas brilliant yeah. okay well just to thank you um both for such a fascinating conversation. It's been really lovely just sitting here and clicking through images and um, probably making a bit of a strange mess of my cursor zooming around the screen. You did perfectly, Miles. But, you know, this will get slicker and more polished <laughs> as we go on. Um, no slickness here. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just to thank you, but also to, to thank all of our attendees who, who have joined us. And, um, and I hope you're all all right. Yeah. In, Seeing a number on our screen which has sort of stayed pretty constant throughout. It's been really well attended. I'm really excited about that and um, thank you very much. So I'm going to now do that embarrassing thing at the end where you go right by and, and then we're all like, mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks but for please joining do, thank you very much. Please do join us again next Tuesday, 8 pm, um, where when we will be talking to Magnus Quaife and Andy Hunt as well. So thank you very much. Um, if I didn't answer anyone's questions, feel free to contact me via email or Instagram. I'm happy to, to try and answer. <laughs> okay, how do I do this? Right, I'm going to press <laughs> on. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Bye. See you next oh, week. Oh, you're probably gone. <laughs>